Hello, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057, Introduction to Law. This is week seven for Term 3, 2017. This is a pre-recorded session in relation to Chapter 7 of your text, which, which deals with interpreting the law. So for those of you studying statutory interpretation, some of you with me already in this term, we'll be covering some of the areas that we are covering that subject. So, of course, it's a basic presumption that you are aware that lawyers use interpretation techniques when considering written material. And that material could be legislation, or it could be case law, or of course other documents. So when we talk about interpreting the law, I really mean interpreting the primary sources, legislation and case law, or secondary sources, um, textbooks, etc. So most of interpretation deals with interpreting legislation, because after all, that's when the law um, is created through Parliament and it takes precedence over case law. One thing you need to consider, and it's often overlooked, is when does a new law take effect? When does it commence? In other words, not all provisions or parts of a new law necessarily commence or take effect at the same time. Details of when a law commences is usually found in the text of the law itself. So look out for things like a heading such as commencement. But failing that, you need to know where to look to consider when the law takes effect. As indicated, it won't necessarily take effect all at the same time. If the commencement information in Commonwealth legislation is not contained in the instrument itself, do have a look at the Legislation Act 2003, and in particular, Section 12. I like to look on the legislation register in that, um, to, to source that information. It's rare, but it's possible that acts can be taking effect retrospectively. That is before they're made or registered on the legislation register. However, legislative instruments and notifiable instruments can only do so if they comply with Section 12 of the Legislation Act 2003. So that's twice that I've made a reference to that piece of legislation. So clearly it's something you need to look at now and consider in the context of uh, any question that might relate to the commencement of legislation at a Commonwealth level. The other thing that you need to do is consider when an amended law um, should be considered by you and applied in answering a particular question. In other words, as the law changes, compilations of the law are amended and they're published on the legislation register. And I'm talking about the Commonwealth at this stage. So each law, um, even though it may have been originally enacted many years ago, is often amended through amending legislation. So when you look at an act as it is at the moment, it is, if you like, a compilation of the original legislation as amended. And sometimes there are many changes that are made to a law. Some of those changes are direct to that particular legislation. Other pieces of legislation take a more general effect and apply. So when you look at the legislation register, do take note of the issue of when compilations of the law were amended and they are published on the register. So what you can do is consider what the law was at a particular time. Now that might be relevant if you are considering a question that relates to an incident that occurred a little time ago. Okay, so that's a fairly basic introduction to some of the issues to do with statutory interpretation at a Commonwealth level. So those of you that are covering the subject separately, will know that um, there are different approaches which are used by courts and um, practitioners to interpreting legislation. Historically, we had the literal approach, uh, the golden rule, uh, the mischief rule. Don't worry too much about those sorts of things. Um, read about them, but understand that we now look at the purposive approach. And in that regard, consider the Acts Interpretation Act, Commonwealth, and state, which deals with the issue of the apparent purpose of the legislation, because that's what the courts will do.
Um, it's always difficult to know exactly what the purpose was of Parliament in creating legislation, but we have got some places that we can look to get an idea. For example, the explanatory notes or explanatory memorandums, Hansard, second reading speeches in particular. And sometimes when you're looking at legislation or a court is looking at legislation, it will consider that in the context of some well-established common law presumptions. So if you look at your text, I'd like you to read carefully issues to do with the approaches used by courts to statutory interpretation, and then look at the common law presumptions, and you'll find those on page 250 of your text. Now, there are a few that I'd like to highlight. Have a look at number one, number two, number 13, and number 15, for example. So number one says, if there is a word in a statute, then the common law presumes that it has its current meaning. The example is Jones against the Commonwealth, number two, 1965, 112 CLR 206. In that case, television broadcasting was determined as fitting within the Commonwealth's legislative power to regulate postal, telegraphic, telephonic, and other like services. So television wasn't considered when the constitution was created. But given that it has its current meaning, things like other like services will, in, will include things um, as they are meant to be now. Also, number two, words have their technical meaning. And you'll find that in law, so certain words do have a specific legal meaning, as opposed to a meaning in a more general sense. So, for example, when a lawyer talks about a contract being frustrated, or in criminal proceedings, an issue of provocation, those words are used in a technical sense. And where they appear in legislation, common law says that we will presume they have their technical meaning. Number 13, things that are not included are excluded. So if a sign, road sign says, parking is not prohibited at certain times, then by implication, parking is permitted at other times. And the only difficulty with that common law presumption is it does provide for some justification in wordiness in drafting, and that is, of course, to be avoided. Number 15 deals with later provisions, overriding earlier provisions. All right, so there's some basic common law rules, and you need to consider those common law rules when providing an, an answer to a question that relates to the interpretation of statutes. You need to consider the general approaches, the purpose of approaches we, we mentioned, and you need to consider the sources of what might be regarded as the purpose of parliament in creating laws. The other thing you need to consider is statutory rules. So in that regard, make sure that you're aware of the Acts Interpretation Act, Always a good standby to look at the Acts Interpretation Act, both the Commonwealth and State. And what the courts do is they look at the Act as a whole. So they will consider the words within the context of the Act totally. Now have a look at page 243 of your text. There's an excellent example. If a court is reading a section about students in the University of South Australia Act 1920, it will interpret the word student, not as referring literally to any type of student, but it will consider the context of the act as a whole and therefore refer to a student in the context of a University of South Australia student. So the purpose of approach. Legislation created the purpose of approach. Have a look at the Acts Interpretation Act, Commonwealth and State. Look at section 15 AA of the Commonwealth and 14A of the state of Queensland. So 15AA, Commonwealth says, in interpreting the provision of an act, the interpretation that will best achieve the purpose or object underlying the act, whether or not that purpose or, and object is expressly stated in the act, is to be preferred to each other interpretation. Section 14A of the Queensland Act has a similar approach. So one might argue that the purpose of approach is contrary to the doctrine of separation of powers. My personal view is that that argument has little weight. 
from a judicial perspective, if you want some authority to support what's said in the, the legislation, I think a good case to refer to and keep in, in your back pocket, as it were, is Mills and Meeking. It's a 1990 High Court decision. The reference is 169 CLR 214. And at 235, the, the High Court, per Dawson J, indicated that the purposive approach has supplanted the literal approach and should be used even if there is no uncertainty or ambiguity. So have a look at your text. Have a look at figure 7.2 on page 246. If you're watching this um, video with access to your text, pause now and study that figure. Make it your own, perhaps even adopt it as part of your legal toolkit. So by reference to that flowchart, to interpret the statute correctly, there are some things that you must be able to do. Firstly, you read the statutory provisions literally, you determine the context of the provision, and then you determine the purpose of the statute. I'm sure that you're all capable of reading the statute provisions literally, but how do you determine the context? And to that regard, we need to rely on legal research skills. So you need to consider the entire act. That's a basic. But when you do, consider the overall structure of the act and look for hints about statutory provisions that are contained within particular divisions or chapters of the act, because there may be different rules that apply to the interpretation of the act as the same words appear within different parts or divisions of the act. And that will give you, by looking at the headings, another guide to the overall structure of the Act. Another important thing is to look at the objects clause of the Act and then supplement that by the extrinsic material such as the explanatory memoranda, the explanatory notes and second reading speech. So all of these are things that you should consider as you proceed. Okay, so determining the object and purpose of the legislation, I guess what is apparent, and for those of you studying statutory interpretation, you'll know this, is you look intrinsically to the act itself and you consider extrinsic materials as well. So, section 15AB of the Commonwealth Act is important because it talks specifically about the use of extrinsic material in the interpretation of an act. So again, be aware of that provision and use it to your advantage when you're answering a question. And really, the interpretation of legislation covers all the areas of legal practice. So it's not something that you remember now, just doing introduction to law or statutory interpretation, but you rely upon these provisions when you're answering other questions as you proceed through your studies in contract law or whatever it might be. And then, of course, you rely on these provisions in practice as well. Now, just a little hint. When you're looking at legislation, remember to look at the end notes because the end notes provide some valuable information about the compilation and the compiled law. So you'll find information um, in the end notes, which deals with the amendment history, which provides an account of how each section of the act has been amended. And that's useful if you're interested in a provision of the act and you can verify from the table if the relevant section has ever been amended, and if so, by what act and when. So it is important to consider the history of the development of the Principal Act, and that is integral to legislative research. So all of this ties into your legal research skills as well. So you'll find this information at the end note of the Act useful in two ways. The first is you can apply the law as it was at the relevant time. For example, if you're dealing with a criminal law matter, you want to ensure that you have the law as it was at the time of the alleged commission of the offence. And the second is to consider why Parliament introduced the amendment, which means that you can go to the appropriate explanatory memorandum or the explanatory note or the second reading speech with respect to that particular amending legislation 
which gives you a better idea of the purpose as to why Parliament changed the law. If you're at your computer now, I'm going to ask you to take a break. Go to the Federal Register of Legislation. Go to the end notes of the Acts Interpretation Act 1901. And you'll see that Amending Act number 27 of 1984 included section 15AB. And you'll find that Parliament made certain comments in the explanatory memorandum to the Amending Act about the introduction of section 15AB. Parliament said, clause seven inserts the new section 15AD, which provides that if material extrinsic to an act is capable of assisting in the interpretation of the meaning of the act, or 15AB rather, then um, it sets forth in a non-exhaustive way the main char characteristics of the extrinsic materials that can assist. And it goes on to then talk about subsection three, expressing the view of parliament, then applying section 15AB, it shall have regard to the matter set forth in the subsection. So just have a read of that, make a note of it. And um, you, know, you might make a note that I obtained the explanatory memorandum from Ostley. Um, those things do change and the Federal Register of Legislation um, is progressively increasing by backdating, I'm sorry, by accessing previous versions of explanatory memorandum, but um, uh, that was at least at the time that I prepared my notes only from 1996. So in other words, when you're looking for the explanatory um, notes or memorandum, you may have to search in either Ostley or the Federal Register of Legislation at a Commonwealth level. Okay, let's talk about the definition of keywords and phrases. When making, uh, when reading legislation made under an act of parliament, you need to consider reg regulations as well. In other words, it's not just the act that may be relevant to answering a legal question. Don't forget to consider the regulations. Also consider section 13 of the uh, Le Legislation Act, um, which deals with the issue of a specific meaning under an act as having the same meaning in any law made under that act unless otherwise stated. All right, so why is the Acts Interpretation Act important? Well, at a Commonwealth level, it creates an overarching piece of legislation that you must consider in a whole range of issues. It also provides for special rules. Again, those of you doing statutory interpretation would be aware that it sets out rules about measuring distance, calculating time, delegating functions or powers under the Act, and it allows the court to interpret legislation using extrinsic materials. Some of the things that you need to consider may even include reports made to Parliament before the legislation was made. So bear in mind that when Parliament creates legislation, it does so in the context of some very detailed, uh, often scientific um, and other material, which is prepared by experts. So those reports that are made to Parliament before legislation were made, it provides a great um, resource. It gives you an idea of why Parliament created legislation, but it also helps to explain um, the legislation. And it's a valuable resource upon which you can rely if you're arguing a case in a certain manner. Apart from that, I've mentioned the explanatory memorandum, the second reading speeches, also consider treaties or international agreements that might be referred to in legislation. <clears throat> now, criminal offences and civil penalties at a Commonwealth level, consider the Crimes Act 1914 and the Criminal Code Act 1995. And they set up the special rules that apply to criminal offences and civil penalties, unless otherwise stated. So it provides detail about what is an offence, how investigations are carried out, what is the prosecution procedure, what defences might be available, and how people might be convicted of criminal offences. I mentioned that it's not just legislation that lawyers need to interpret. Lawyers also need to interpret contracts 
So there are special rules that apply to contractual interpretation. And the traditional approach is the objective approach. In other words, what would a reasonable person, looking from the side as it were, or from the Clapham omnibus as it was, as, as it was, as it were, um, consider in the context of what was meant by the parties. In other words, it's not the subjective intentions of the parties that are taken into account. So it's a little different to the way in which we interpret parliamentary legislation. So if the court was called upon to interpret the words of a written contract, it will consider the written terms in the context of um, uh, the prior negotiations or context. Um, it, will, it will consider those, but really the written contract is the important part. So if you have a written agreement, work on the assumption that it's a complete record of the agreement. There are some exceptions. The exceptions may be if there was a verbal representation or promise intended to be a term of the contract, it may, be, it may include the, that agreement, um, and there are statutory provisions that may help consumers in terms of <clears throat> interpretation. Okay. If, you, if you've got your text with you, just have a break now. Have a look at page 260, and you'll see some comments about how courts will try to fill gaps to deal with issues to do with uncertainty, but they'll only go so far, and this is in the context of contracts. It will only do so if it's reasonable and fair, necessary, almost goes without saying, can be clearly expressed, and is consistent with the expressed terms. And again, the courts will use an objective test in that regard. So what we've been talking about is interpreting material. I haven't done much tonight in terms of dealing with interpretation of case law. That's something that we'll cover through the course. But we have covered some basic rules in relation to statutory interpretation and issues to do with contractual interpretation. So by now, you should be trying to put everything together. You should be applying your skills and be better positioned to understand legislation. Try this as an exercise. Can you provide an explanation of Section 8 of the Civil Proceedings Act 2011, which is Queensland? And it simply says this, Section 8, Equitable Damages. If a court has jurisdiction to hear an application for an injunction or specific performance, the court may award damages as well as, or instead of, an injunction or specific performance. To be able to read that section, you firstly need to know what we mean by equitable as a, and, and know what, what, what is it opposed to? Equitable as opposed to what? What do we mean by damages? Then we say, okay, if a court has jurisdiction to hear an application for an injunction or specific performance, and I'll stop there, that would suggest that not every court has jurisdiction to hear an application for an injunction or specific performance. A couple of things flow from that. The first is you'll need to understand what courts have jurisdiction to hear such applications. In order to answer that, you'll need to understand what is an injunction or what is specific performance. The section goes on to say that if the court can hear the application, it may award damages as well as or instead of those equitable remedies that I've mentioned being injunction and specific performance. So have a look at that section and ask yourself, can you interpret it? Can you explain it? Can you apply it if it was part of an exam question, for example? Okay, thank you for your patience. I know it's been difficult to listen to a monologue. Greetings from Iceland. We'll see you later. All the best.